The regulation of blood pressure is crazy complicated, crazy cool. Um, autonomic nervous system, endocrine system, overlapping functions of each given thing on both like vasoconstriction as well as altering fluid volume sometimes. So it kind of gets, um, it gets messy. Um, so I'm gonna start by teaching you like what are the key things you need to know about and then we'll put them together. Um, so and different ways to categorize this regulation. One is like, are the effects short-term or are they long-term and longer lasting? This somewhat overlaps with endocrine versus nervous system um, stimulus, but not 100%. So these tend to be endocrine. There's some exceptions to that. Um, actually, no, there's, there's not really exceptions to that. They, they tend to be endocrine. Long-term regulation of blood pressure is altering fluid volume. There could be a neural stimulus for this though um, that results in an endocrine um, hormone, right, in the bloodstream. Short-term tend to be nervous system. In this case, sometimes this can result in a hormone that both has short-term and long-term effects. So some of the hormones involved in the regulation of blood pressure have both short-term and long-term effects. That's why this is not perfect, um, but it, it's a little bit, and that's what you know about the endocrine system and nervous system, right? Nervous system is quick, it's for quick responses. When you stand up um, after lying down very quickly and get lightheaded, that is a nervous system response that's keeping you from fainting, um, keeping your blood pressure up. When you're hemorrhaging and bleeding out, your endocrine system helps you retain fluids to keep you from losing too much, um, well, having the effects of losing too much blood being that you faint. So long-term tends to be fluid volume. And I'm gonna write here all the things that we're gonna go over. So let's do short-term first. Short term, how does your how is your blood pressure regulated? Cardiac output, stroke volume, and total peripheral resistance. Yeah, those are all quick ways your body can regulate blood pressure. Some quicker than others. Um, yeah, you know these two kind of what what affect those. Um, primarily we've got, I know I mentioned this before, we've got our cardio acceleratory region in the medulla that can, um, I'm sorry, this should be, so cardiac output is going to be heart rate and stroke volume. That's the two mechanisms for increasing cardiac output, right? Cardiac output can be altered by altering heart rate. The cardioacceleratory region is responsible for that. Um, or stroke volume, which is, these are both autonomic nervous system. Parasympathetic involved in heart rate changes, sympathetic involved in both, both of them because contractility is what can be can alter stroke volume. One thing that can alter stroke volume, not the only thing. Part of the ANS is going to be the adrenal medulla releasing epinephrine into circulation. So now it's a hormone. So now we're, that's why it tends to be nervous, but it was it was a it's a hormone being released to also affect heart rate and stroke volume. So it's just whether it's direct synapses or a hormone traveling in the bloodstream. Total peripheral resistance. What affects that? There are three things: um, viscosity, blood vessel length. Right. length and diameter. And diameter is the one that we can rapidly alter 
to change total peripheral resistance in our bodies to change blood pressure. So those are the short-term ones, but we're gonna have some more overlap here. So let's go into fluid volume. Um, actually, first, let me tell you some things that can directly can affect TPR, that total peripheral resistance. We can have our sympathetic nervous system. So the same mechanism by which the autonomic nervous system increases heart rate and stroke volume there's beta receptors on the blood vessels so that we can vasoconstrict and vasodilate to alter the diameter of the blood vessels by direct innervation from the autonomic nervous system. Likewise, adrenal medulla release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, right? Same idea. And three more, I'm just gonna throw them out there and tell you what they are later. Antidiuretic hormone, angiotensin, and atrial natriuretic peptide. These are all going to be hormones. These two here are going to cause vasoconstriction. This one causes vasodilation. Now, these three are also going to be part of long-term regulation. So when we go over to long-term, we're talking about changes in fluid volume. It takes longer to implement this, and it also um, lasts longer. So fluid volume, blood volume is what that means. The amount of blood that's traveling in your body. This is going to be primarily endocrine response um, involves the kidneys as well, though. The kidneys release a hormone. Antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic. So retain water in kidneys. ADH also causes vasoconstriction. So it's going to be a response to low blood pressure, both quick vasoconstriction and by allowing your body to maintain more water. Angiotensin. Angiotensin is um, going to be triggered by the kidneys, renin in the kidneys. It actually is going to trigger ADH. It's also going to trigger aldosterone. It's also going to trigger vasoconstriction. So let's have it go there. And I already told you down here, the cause vasoconstriction. Aldosterone is going to cause sodium reabsorption in the kidneys. Why do we care about that? When you have sodium reabsorption occur, water is reabsorbed along with it. So it's a mechanism for reabsorbing more water, similar to ADH. When we get to the kidney, you'll see the difference in where those occur. Okay, two more hormones. One's down here, atrial natriuretic peptide. This is released in response to high blood pressure by the atria, and it's um, going to result in, sorry, result in inhibiting a bunch of these other things. So it's going to inhibit these guys. Um, it's going to decrease absorption in the kidney. And as I have down here, it's going to cause vasodilation. So it's the only one, it's actually unique, um, the only one of these that is going to be released in response to high blood pressure. The rest of these are released in response to low blood pressure. And it really, that really highlights the importance of maintaining um, normal tissue perfusion. We've got a lot of mechanisms to keep our blood pressure, keep blood flow going, because um, that's really important. Even though we think of high blood pressure as being so bad, it's too high, of course it is, but most of our mechanisms are designed to um, maintain blood pressure. MAP, okay. I, oh, one more long-term one. Um, I'll throw it in here. It's not gonna come up again to, to, to the end 
is erythropoietin. So remember erythropoietin is stimulates blood cell production. So if we increase erythropoietin, we're gonna have more blood cells produced and that increases the volume of the blood. So EPO is gonna throw it in there. Um, this would be a long-term um, way to deal with um, low blood volume by resulting in production of more blood cells. It also, that's also gonna increase viscosity, which increases pressure. It also can be a vasoconstrictor. So it's another one that has widespread effects. I should talk about it a little bit, bit less than though. So we, we could add it down here though as um, another, another thing that affects diameter. So that is your overview.